Support for Lab Out Loud is provided by NSTA, the National Science Teaching Association. Find out more about what NSTA has to offer at nsta.org. This episode of Lab Out Loud is sponsored by Discovery Education. Enter the Siemens STEM Day Possibility Grant sweepstakes daily for a chance to win one of five $5,000 grants to help foster STEM learning at your school. Enter today at SiemensSTEMDay.com. You're listening to Lab Out Loud, Science for the Classroom and Beyond. And today our guest is here to talk to us about how to cultivate the next generation of science teachers. It's also kind of really about changing this perception about what assessment is. It's something that is happening all the all the time. And what I'm doing in the class on everyday day basis that I can actually use, look into, analyze, diagnose, and that is an assessment because it's telling me how my students are doing, how they are thinking about these ideas, right? And how I can adapt my instruction going forward. That's up next on Lab Out Loud, but first, I'm your co-host Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartel. Joining us today is Dr. Manakshi Sharma. She joins us to talk about an article she wrote that details the characteristics of elementary teachers who effectively implement next generation science standards. Let's welcome Dr. Sharma. Hi, I'm so glad to be here. My name is Manakshi. I am an assistant professor in science education at Mercer University. And here at Mercer, I prepare pre-service teachers, uh, mostly elementary science te- uh, pre-service teachers to be future science teachers. And I also work with a lot of in-service teachers in the context of professional development or I would uh, they have them in my STEM endorsement courses where they are learning to teach how to implement STEM in their science classroom, which can be K through 12. They could be from any grade level. Um, so, and as a researcher, I have, I'm also trying to include in my research how to improve science teaching and learning for as I prepare non-traditional students to be pre-service science teachers. And I also use a lot of framework of teacher noticing with my STEM research, trying to see how science teachers are implementing science and engineering practices uh, in their classrooms. Oh, wow. So we caught you on an article that you authored um, from uh, a from theconversation.com, and that is, uh, the title of the article is Five Characteristics of an Effective Science Teacher from a Researcher Who Trains Them. And so, you know, that caught our eye there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what prompted you to write that article? And uh, and we'll just dive into what, what are those characteristics? So, so there were a lot of inspirations behind writing that article. So, first of all, I knew what is the you know, goal of the conversation. So it's really about providing information to all the readers about what's going on in science education uh, in a very simple, straightforward language, but in with evidence, in an evidence-based way. So I think I really did like everyone to know what science education should look like in elementary grades, and I wanted to do that in a very simple, straightforward language so that anybody uh, who reads this article can understand, and that can be uh, teachers, that can be parents. Uh, So you can say that it really gets also motivated by the status of science education in the country, right? I I want everybody who reads the article to know, okay, this this is the kind of quality of science education my child should be getting in the schools, or this is what teachers should be trained for, or this is what I'm accountable for, uh, for my teachers defining their professional development if I'm an administrator. So I really wanted that to speak to everyone, uh, and I think that's that's kind of inspired me to write it. 
And you mentioned that in the article that there's a there's a shift from what we would, I guess, called uh, classical science education to using the next generation science standards. And that's kind of what you're getting at there is what uh, what should science instruction and what should science learning look like in your student's classroom or in your child's classroom? Correct. Yes. Yes. And so. So. I use NGSs as a kind of a framework to write the article, right? Because uh, the NGSs standards, which are, you know, inspired by the uh, National Science Education Framework, are talking about these practices which are evidence-based, that are research-based. So for me as a researcher and a science educa- a teacher educator who is inspired by the next generation science standards, for me that really tells what good or rigorous quality science instruction should be like. So I really use that as a framework to write the article and all the characteristics are really emerging from what's the vision of, of the next generation science standards and how that vision defines what good science teaching should look like. And in the article, you would see that I try to give a lot of examples and embedded a lot of links because I did want readers to see those examples of what I was talking about uh, in the article, what these characteristics are, but what do they really look like when implemented in the classroom? Um, And that was all uh, very much grounded in the next generation science standards as a good view or vision for science teaching and science literacy. Okay. Let's take a look at some of these characteristics that, um, and again, you're, you're thinking about this more from an elementary lens rather than a secondary lens where you may have just one teacher teaching science all day versus an elementary generalist who is teaching all of the subjects, correct? Yes, so definitely. This article, though it does not say too much about elementary, but yes, I mostly took the lens of as an elementary science teacher educator there. But I think all the characteristics are very much applicable at any grade level. Okay. Really teachers to see and learn from it, right? Mm-hmm. So, but I do come from that um, stance where I'm talking about uh, elementary pre-service teachers or elementary science teachers and classrooms. Hmm. And in some ways that, that may give, it, it may sound counterintuitive, but it may give some teachers a little bit more leeway in implementing the standards rather than, uh, a, you know, and you, one of the characteristics you mentioned is, you know, incorporating or integrating science with other subjects. So sometimes that might be a little bit easier for an elementary teacher, whether they realize that yeah. or not. Actually, that's the number one thing that my elementary pre-service teachers ask for is more and more strategies and ways to integrate science with other content areas. Oh, really? Um, because yeah, that's the that's the way they argue is that they have more and more chance to teach science in the classroom if they are able to do so. Well, good. Oh, that's I heartening. See. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, it's a little easier when you have to coordinate yeah. with yourself. You don't have to like if you're in a secondary situation, you have to try to coordinate with other teachers and schedules. Yeah. And even for even at the secondary level, if we think about uh, a lot of focus now shifting to STEM as well, mm-hmm. you know, that that in, in that integration part has a sense there also. But it's mostly math and engineering uh, focus. But with elementary teachers, they want ways how they can teach science by integrating it with math and ELA and so sure. like I try to give them a lot of example of good curricula that are out there that they can, you know, use and adapt for them to be able to teach science in this integrated manner. Do you think that um, can you take can you speak of the direction in, the, in which that's flowing? And what I mean by that is we often see uh, ELA teachers, for instance, that are having students read about science and then they they maybe mentally tick a box that says, oh, we're doing science. And of course, they're just reading about science. So that's a little bit different there. Um, are you saying that we might find the science going into some of these other subject areas in the other direction? So I think uh, they, uh, teachers need guidance for which what that direction can look like. 
when they so it really starts in the way that you described right reading a book a science book maybe and then maybe thinking about oh i did try to integrate science with literacy here right but right. what it should look like to be more meaningful way of integrating science and literacy right so for that they they do need some direction and guidance which i try to provide them in my methods courses so for example i always ask my teachers to be first think of a very strategic point where they would like to introduce a text in their planning so where they would like to introduce a text and you know base a few questions that they have already been discussing prior to that or maybe there are some investigations that they did prior to that they can very strategically talk about and discuss with their students while they read through that book so that it's more intentional and conscious reading than just you know plain simple reading with no examples or no connections to make right uh, you can't see me but i'm shaking my head yeah so in agreeing with you <laughs> yeah <laughs> and one thing i also do is that i always try to inspire teachers to use books that present more authentic uh images more authentic descriptions of things or at least juxtapose the images they see in the children literature or children books if they try to use that with the authentic images uh online or some way find authentic image to look like so i would inspire them to actually look at the image of moon phases from nasa's website and oh, actually okay. for real images of moon than also reading the book based on moon phases right so that they can have more to talk about and more to discuss uh with their students about that also sometimes critique the book for you know once they have done the unit or almost gone through a lot of conceptual ideas that that were there in that topic they bring in a children's book or a literature there or an article to be honest uh, which is more friendly uh, a grade level friendly article and see like how this article or the this book is comparing and contrasting with some of the things they have done are there any questions that they will raise for what is being described in this book or an article so i try to give all these strategies to my uh, pre service teachers if they are you know they want to they are so many of them really actually are very confident in teaching you know language arts mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and we know that that their self efficacy issues and confidence issues in elementary teachers to be able to teach science but they are very confident and uh, when they talk about being able to teach literacy and so i want to build on that confidence and bring in these strategies which they can use and be, become more meaningful use more meaningful approaches to teach science with literacy So that exa that example of looking at the book is kind of like the first two things you mentioned in the article nurtures student curiosity encourages scientific thinking just that book from the ELA section could be a bridge and then <laughs> it looks like that would essentially bring in the I mean we might be able to then use that to you know the, the integration of science with other subjects correct Yeah absolutely so Like, I guess what I'm saying is you can hit a couple of these at once. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely you can. Think yeah, think about the moon phases example. Like you will have many teachers have students keep moon of uh, the journals for moon phases, right? Mhm. Mm and then they read a book or they are looking at NASA's website and looking at these patterns, they can that's right there they are actually making sense of this phenomena, right? Mhm. Mm they are doing that sense making uh that is they are literally uh that i mentioned in the article but i also mentioned in the article about these everyday ways of student sense making right like i think that's something that's also very difficult for teachers to get into is to 
make sure that they are listening to students when they are talking about science but they are doing so in a very you know using a common language or everyday language or sometimes they are using words that are very specific to the background where they come from their cultural backgrounds and so to listen into that and not really look for the science vocabulary or the answers mm. so i think that's one of the one of the challenges for sure in these processes because these are the processes that can obstruct that sense making that will probably naturally happen when you create these opportunities right mhm mm you have um let's just run through these quick uh, number 1 nurtures student curiosity to encourage scientific thinking three develops scientific literacy four integrates science with other subjects which we've been talking about and then five uses classroom assessments to support student learning those are kind of the um road markers here for this for this discussion yeah so i included scientific literacy also very intentionally because i see when a lot of uh science teachers at any grade level elementary or second they talk about it i think they think a lot about uh stem careers and like we are teaching science so that we can have students in these uh stem careers in these stem fields which i totally agree with but they kind of lose vision of this very important goal of science education which is to develop scientific literacy and i think is that something that we really need to put attention on that have, so that's the reason that i come from that stance of also using phenomena that are based in, which are like socio scientific issues which are relatable to students life so i recently i have been able to use covid-19 a lot of resources on covid-19 as an example of how and why it is important for everybody to understand these communications that are happening through so many different media and mm -hmm. what are the science ideas that are embedded in this topic and why everybody needs to understand it and that's why this argument for scientific literacy mm -hmm. I noticed that you have the a piece of local or global phenomena mm -hmm. in talking about science developing scientific literacy and I think as you mentioned uh, COVID-19 would be a, a pretty good and easy example for students to understand mm -hmm. that piece there but what about the local side of things so mm -hmm. a, a local issue is that an easier or a harder thing for teachers to implement within the classroom so I think to identify a local issue is absolutely comes very naturally you know so for example i did try to do it with one section of my pre service teachers where we talked about some of the local issues that are have these uh, scientific ideas behind them like how we can use these issues to teach science right and then that went into a little bit of place based learning kind of a uh, mood right mm -hmm. so this is your place what's the issue here let's talk about it and so they talked about water quality or they would talk about like hey i used to go to this uh park and i so see this happening in my local creek or things like that no, right sir. so i think it's it's not difficult for them to recognize and identify things like even in their school backyard like they will say like okay i want to to do this because i see this is a issue that's concerning my students or this is concerning our school but many times this is what i have seen happening and i'm sure people who are doing research on these topics can say more is that in the process of implementing these issues in the classroom to teach science uh the teachers attentions mostly i have seen shifts less to science but more on the social aspects of the issue oh It's sure more on the social aspect of the issue so i always have to kind of navigate that with like okay so let's see what are the science ideas here what do 
students need to understand in the class science classroom to be understand what this issue is really all about okay. so uh and i have to do that in inten- in a very intentional way because i do see that so like hurricanes is one topic that climate uh, other kind of weather issues and all uh in this region that teachers want to talk and discuss uh in their class and so the identifying i would say the issue is not a problem but how to work with that issue and keep a focus on the social and the science part in a balanced way that's i think is a real challenge it may also i would imagine sometimes be difficult to find uh resources that support your local issue yes. um or maybe or maybe that's easier because you have local experts that you can tap into no i think that's definitely there the resources part that you just mentioned and i think when they when when i work with pre service teachers in my mathes courses that's one thing is that i always have them for a very short time period right so for non traditional students most of my courses run in a blended format and in eight eight week courses uh which is very short time to be with them and i always try to give like a lot of resources and a lot of ass- assignments that i build in my course are always uh involve them engaging with some of the good resources on science teaching and learning that they can leverage even when they have left the course right mm-hmm. so uh to be able to know your good resources that you can use to adapt if even if you're using already prescribed curriculum in the school i think is very very important um mm-hmm. i i know maybe if you are not getting professional development which is very very rare for elementary uh teachers to get in science mm-hmm. i think see that uh that could be a big problem there when they are not constantly updated and don't know what's out there that they can use to enhance their teaching but i think when i have them in the mathes course i try to do my best to give them do you have them covered and say like hey see this uh this is something that you can use even after you have left the course right hmm. you mentioned that there's uh, you know the fifth piece we haven't talked about yet is the the using assessments and a good a hallmark of a good science teacher is using classroom assessments to support that student learning um and i'm thinking in my head too like that you know the way we used to do science might be to test students and that's kind of like a moment in time so for sometimes for sometimes when i was going through science classes sometimes it felt you like a gotcha moment and then that was said and done but you're saying we need to use assessments to support that learning and then this would be a very much a personal kind of endeavor within your classroom and it's not necessarily to report on on a state test which might be challenging if you're talking about local um issues within you know the context of science education rather than you know what is a what is a universal standardized test look like yeah and, and i i know so yeah with that's one of the it again goes back to the systemic issues of the, how to be able to teach science in elementary classrooms right and then so and the assessments like to be really have these of high quality resources to teach science and then to have high quality assessments right that's yeah. another step ex- seems to be like an extra step so that's so that's what i so i talk a lot about formative assessments in my uh courses and the reason for them is and i is that i always try to see like ha- help my free service teachers see as much as i can that how they can be teaching in this way and create a lot of things on in that teaching process the artifacts that they can actually use as pieces for formative assessment and so so i really like to have them not think about assessment this very rigid way where they have to take that don't know or don't know kind of a stance right mm-hmm. and a more analytical stance towards their students learning so i try to have them like okay let's let's see on the first day of your teaching when you introduced a phenomena what are what is it that students had to 
say to explain what they think, why and how that happened. And and I tried them not to help to see like this is these are their partial explanations in the beginning that is going to tell you what their background knowledge is and how they are talking about these ideas. So I, I have them make sure that they record these students ideas in some way so that they have something to look back to. OK. Right? So like if they have a whiteboard, have the ideas out there. If they ask students to draw and show, keep those artifacts, encourage them to write descriptions in small groups or even listen to into what students are talking in the small groups. And that is all assessment because okay. that's telling them where is it going and what they need to teach for. What are the student ideas and how they might want to use them to plan what they're going to be planning ahead in their instruction. So almost a almost a probe of where they are and yeah. wanting to know what I need to do to get them to where they should be. Yeah, and, and, and that's I think it's also kind of really about changing this perception about what assessment is and oh, what sure. is it for. And what I'm doing in the class on everyday day basis that I can actually use, look into, analyze, diagnose, and that is an assessment because it's telling me how my students are doing, how they are thinking about these ideas, right? And how mm -hmm. I can adapt my instruction going forward. So not taking a pause and really waiting to give that quiz or do that worksheet, but things that are even happening naturally, but you're intentional into listening, into noticing and interpreting that what is going on in here is an assessment. So so that they don't think about it always in that summative way. Oh, I did not did not do that quiz or I did not give that exit slip. But it's something that is happening all the all the time. That's I, I think that's something, you know, you are familiar with the 5E model, right? And five a lot of teachers use 5E's model or framework to plan their instruction. And I think in that uh because how they use it is also in a way when they think about it, they always think about evaluation as something that's coming at the end. Right. Not that's kind of there at every point if they are noticing and interpreting what students are thinking. After the break, we'll be right back. The 2022 Siemens STEM Day Possibility Grant Sweepstakes is now open to all U.S. schools. Teachers, enter daily for your chance to win one of five $5,000 grants to help foster STEM learning at your school. This is your chance to get the STEM technology and resources you have been dreaming of. Inspire a love of STEM in your students with access to tech tools, gadgets, and learning resources you need to keep them engaged. The possibilities are endless. Enter today and every day through April 22nd at SiemensStemDay.com. And now, back to the show. Well, something that worries me when I would do things like you mentioned in class, um, let's say we have students that are describing something in a small group, you go around and you listen, take notes of these kinds of things. I was always concerned that because you have to notice more, but what if my own bias or process of noticing is not seeing or hearing all of the students? What are what if some are, I guess, hiding in the conversation? And how do I how do I check for that? Or how do I then in my mind, I guess I still came back to some sweeping everybody takes it assessment that makes sure that I'm you know, corroborating the things that I'm observing in the class. So I think your concern is valid, but it's also, so it's, so teacher noticing is something which is like a practice that will evolve over time, right? Mm -hmm. So like if you are a teacher who is, well, we hope, like how I'm <laughs> noticing, what I'm noticing for, right? then you are going to be, you are someone who is going to work on on this uh, practice, right? So mm -hmm. 
maybe you've set goals for yourself that, <clears throat> okay, this is what my students are working on these small groups. These are the questions that I'm going to ask them in a very intentional way. Uh, this is how I'm going to probe, probe them because this is what I want to draw their attention to. And I will be listening into these ideas. What are they talking about this? So I think to have some goal for that noticing is a good step in every learning opportunity or any activity that you create for your students. And that's how I think you kind of go in and keep developing that uh, practice within yourself as a as a teacher. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 I do truly believe that's also not something that you just can develop just on your own. You need a professional learning community who can look into your work, give you some, uh, you know, feedback is like, hey, this is the student work you're looking at. Are you looking at this? Are you looking at this? Do you notice this? What do you think about that? So I think that no teacher noticing skill is something that is going to develop and evolve over time, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but it's even important if you're oriented to be that teacher who notices and listens. I think that's yeah. one of the most important steps right there. One of the little side benefits when you do it in class, um, because these kinds of things can take time, and I think one of the feedback, one of the pushbacks you can get from teachers is, well, if I'm not doing, you know, yes/no questions, if I'm not doing list of facts, definitions, those kinds of things, then that's much harder to have, like, let's say, a learning management system auto grade something for me to save time, um, which is true. I mean, if you have lots and lots of students in your class, this gets into a problem of scale. Um, one advantage of doing that assessment sort of in class as you're going around, as the students are working, is you, you, you're not taking that home. <laughs> you're doing it while it, it's, it's really just merged right with your teaching. Um, so your assessment and your teaching are working hand in hand. Um, it is, you know, it's on a stack you're taking home, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That merging thing you just said, that's what Brian, I was talking about earlier to mm-hmm. help teachers see that it's merged. It's not something that's separate, right? And you right. need to listen. And I think with the pandemic, with a lot of great technology resources that have teachers have started using, yeah, they probably need to stay because in many ways they have helped uh, in some of uh, these issues that we are talking about here like teachers doing a jam board uh, where students can post their ideas about how and why they think a phenomena is happening. And uh, then going to that jam board and looking at students' sticky notes and maybe, you know, categorizing them and seeing what patterns are there in student thinking. You know, that's going to be with you forever. And that record is go- not going anywhere. So right. I, I think a lot of digital resources that have come up can really help with this this work. I thought you were going to say the opposite, actually. I thought you were going to say that some of these digital resources are too focused on, you know, these self-grading tools, those kinds of things, those kind of flashcardy things that can't actually do the work that you're, you're talking about. Yeah, but, yeah, so it depends what you are using the dig- digital tool for, right? Uh-huh. So, uh... So I, I'm sure you are familiar with, with the Jamboard. You are uh, in mm-hmm. yeah. technology and all. So I, I see that how that helps, first of all, students who would not talk too much, write what they want to write and write their ideas, right? Absolutely. Uh, like my daughter is one of them. And like she would happily write on a sticky note, but never speak up, uh, mm-hmm. you know? So... And how, and then all the ideas are right there for students to kind of see and look into. And then this kind of uh, processes can be used at any step of the instruction. And peer feedback can be, uh, you know, involved into it, uh, like giving students each other some ideas and even Google Docs with at least some of the uh, advanced students, uh, higher grade levels who are well versed with these technologies. And they can collaborate on a Google Doc. And those Google Docs you can design in a way where you can look, go back and look at 
students' conversations, what they are saying, and how they are thinking through this, or collaborate data through a Google Doc and analyze data through through the, those docs when students are working in small groups, and then go back and see like how oh, how are they looking at this data. Then you mm-hmm. have something to go back and ask students questions about and probe them further about, right? It's almost like a tool that's collecting some of that evidence for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, it sounds like, you know, you have your five, you have your list of five categories or your five characteristics here. And, you know, you might have a teacher that looks at it and says, yeah, I check all the boxes. But it also sounds like you have a couple other things that you may have wanted to add, like uh, curate a professional learning community, oh, stay yeah. current with particip- yeah. participation tools with, you know, digital participation tools, things like that. Are there, are there any other pieces that you're like, oh, uh, you know, if I was allowed six to ten <laughs> more, what, what else would I have had in there? <laughs> there was a that's quota? Right. We could have 59. No, uh, but were there other things that you're like, oh, yeah, that that's probably a good one, too? Yeah, I think, yes, definitely. So I think there was one thing that I wanted to talk about. And one of the people comments commented on that also is the teacher curiosity, right? I think that plays a very important role. Uh, and oh, absolutely. I yeah, I like that. Curiosity is very much related to uh, what we were talking just now about the noticing, right? So let's think about it. What you're noticing is sometimes can be very motivated by your own curiosity as a teacher, how you plan is something, okay, I'm also curious about about this. So one of the things that I, I like to do with my pre-service teachers is that use, uh, uh, because it's a blended class, so we have synchronous and asynchronous sessions as well, that they go back and actually do nature journaling for me. Uh, they go out and find phenomena in nature and make observations and collect data in nature. Or they would go and try uh, some phenomena for me from ngssphenomena.com or they would just go about and do something that they would like to try, which is a new phenomena and bring to us as a class. Because I want them to nurture their curiosity as well, because that's something they would be doing with their little young learners, right? So right. Uh, wh- that's one thing. For sure. And I think this, that's also a relationship building with your students, who they are, where they come from, what do they bring to your science classroom. And I think it's also a good piece of modeling, too. If students can see you yeah. actively engaging in your own curiosities, that that tells them that that's OK for them to do as well. Yeah. So I think that relationship building piece is also very important because otherwise it's it's hard to make that connection with mm-hmm. your students. Right. And I think with post pandemic, it has it has even become more important. Like I think th- these things have already been more very, very uh, um, important in science classrooms. And it seems like some things have become even much more important after post uh, pandemic classrooms, like how students are being like they were in outside of school for many uh, for a long time. Some of them started first grade and never went to kindergarten and, you know, were never right. had that connection with the teachers. So I think using that curiosity and teacher curiosity, showing your own curiosity and nurturing students, what they bring and who they are, where they come from. Uh, like t- even I wanted to, and if I would have had the opportunity to uh, emphasize a bit more on uh, the language part and what language children speak at home, what are the ideas that they are uh, bringing from home and how they use those ideas to talk about science in my classroom. Who do I see as a smart science student? So I think those are some of the things that orientations you can see are the questions that a a science teacher should ask themselves uh, or an elementary science teacher uh, should probably be thinking about is probably I was not able to include them directly into this article, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but I think those are equally important, uh, and in some way are very much intertwined with some of these things that are Absolutely. in the article. Yeah, we've talked about some of these things about you know things to that 
that the attributes that are not in the class, like not yes and no questions or very, um, you know, list of facts and things like that. In addition to those kinds of things, are there sort of the, you know, sort of the anti-list? Like these are the flags that you should be wa- warning signs that you should be watching for. Like if you were um, observing this, be like, uh oh, this is a this is a point here we have to correct on. Okay, I'm not sure if I fully understood your question, but you are saying that. So, so for example, maybe let me answer this. So, if students are using too much vocabulary words, mm-hmm. like right there, I would see like, okay, I would want to, you know, have them explain those things or ask them for evidence about why they are saying what they are saying. Because sometimes I think students know the school game and they kind of try to give you what you're looking for. Yeah, for sure. So, so <laughs> I've had students come to me and go, is this what you want? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, other than just not looking for like right, wrong answers, like that's something which is a flag about like, hey, okay, so you have this perfectly designed answer. Uh huh. You know, where is this coming from? Can you explain this more? Or would you put it in a context? Or will you so like pushing it more so that they explain it more and then you can see a that distinction between like where how much the understanding is and how much is really uh really absorbing and memorizing facts and talking about that, right? So Mm -hmm. it can be in the sometimes that at home students have that kind of a support or they go uh, to places where they will be like cramming up information and then reproducing that because, and and that's not their fault. I think some way school science is, has been like that, right? Sure. So, yeah. I mean, or it's just not supported enough and your child's coming home with way yeah. too many worksheets of fill in the blanks, you know, and that might be a, mm-hmm. uh, that for me, that was a warning sign. Like, mm-hmm. what are we doing here? Like, this just seems like. And what aren't you doing? Yeah. I just take notes and I just, the teacher goes through this and I fill in the blanks and I'm like, oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And introducing that multimodality in your classroom, I think for students to be able to express themselves like through writing or talking or there can be some students who have these excellent ideas, but they are too shy to talk. So like who is not or or the language, you know, so they might not have the uh, the English language. Learners. So many of them may have a lot of uh, good ability to speak, but they might still not be at a stage where they can read or write well. So they, they do need some scaffolds there to be able to express themselves. Mm-hmm. So what ideas you are getting, but like who you are not getting these ideas from, who is not participating and why. Uh, yeah, got it. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if I answered your question. No, you did. No, that makes yep. that, that, that that was perfect. Well, thank you so much, Meenakshi, for joining us. And uh, rumor before we let you go, rumor has it that uh, you may have used some of our podcasts in your um, <laughs> in your classroom with your pre-service science teachers. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I have uh, so I was actually looking at my uh, class methods course that I recently taught. Uh, we were very much focused on place-based learning, so. I had oh. them uh, do that, and we also, I think, uh, had uh, Professor Campbell's um, talk on phenomena. Uh, oh, good. Listen to that, and I, so this is uh, this is what I think I mentioned earlier. Also, with my adult learners, I really dig for these resources that they can listen to, uh, mm-hmm. because they have busy life, they have multiple jobs, and they do school in the evening with me. So uh, just reading about things all the time is not very beneficial. So I try to use different kind of modes to help them engage and learn about what good science teaching is. Sure, so yeah. I think that podcast serves a great uh, role there. Uh, we were talking about social scientific issues in my classrooms uh, last semester and 
um, I'm just now my the, the name of the author is not coming to my mind. And she did a po- podcast with you where they talked about how to teach socio-scientific issues in elementary classrooms. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we use that podcast because it really aligned with the book from that same author that we read through our our library resources. So they were able to listen to the author through your podcast and they were able to read the book. So that was like perfect for me because in many cases, sometimes I try to like invite the author to the class. Okay, sure. Yeah. So I'm clicking through some of our our, phone, our uh, <laughs> You're trying to find episodes. him now, Brian? <laughs> uh, is, is it Laurie Walmark? No, no. It's about the, uh, talking about the social scientific issues in in the the classroom. I think oh. I have. I'll have to go deep into the archives for that one. Brian has a spreadsheet of them all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can definitely find it out for you. No, we'll have to we'll have to think about it. Um, but as you're thinking a little bit more, one of the reasons that we both love podcasts, Dale and I, and kind of got into this is that you know we do um, listen to podcasts a lot while we're just going through yeah. everyday activities, commuting, walking. Um, you know, a lot of those people that you mentioned still have to mow the lawn or shovel snow, depending on where you are. And uh, I like to have. Uh, you know, I like to have those podcasts with me as I'm doing those activities. Yeah, so this this was the podcast uh, by uh, so we were reading this book by Zeidler and Cam, if I'm saying the name correct. So you had a podcast from Dr. Owen Sadler and Zeidler. Oh, okay. And this okay. Is, was also this book is uh, it's debatable, and actually they have a new version of the book. It's called It's Still Debatable. And using social scientific issues to develop scientific literacy. Oh, sure. And they have a book uh, that's like uh, very much just focused on K through five classrooms. So oh, it, yeah, okay. so it really it was so good to be able to go through the book and actually being able to listen into some of the things that were mentioned in the book through the podcast. Mm. Okay. So that, that that that's like for me is the perfect combo i would say you know listening to something and it has its own way of getting into your learning right so um i'm sure if people doing research on podcasts have to say more about how your learning get enhanced by listening to a podcast i don't know about that but uh, this for us was very very useful to be able to listen to the people who are working in the field and to read a book uh, so I use that for sure. And the one with the phenomena, because there's a lot of focus on phenomena. They try to you know their own, they go out and try phenomena in nature. Uh, so why phenomena, why we want to focus on phenomena based instruction. And you have some really good podcasts right there on those topics. It was the socio-scientific issue approach addressing controversial yes. issues in the <laughs> science classroom. <laughs> Is that right? right? Found yes. it. We'll Episode make sure to have that link 181, in our show notes, Brian. <laughs> What's that? Episode 181. 181. That's yeah. wow. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a bit. It's ago. hard for us to remember which ones too. We're like, did we yeah, talk about you that? Yeah, and the resources uh, beneath that. You have the book. Uh-huh. Uh, it's uh, still deb- uh, it's debatable. Yes. And it's called. Uh, there is. We read a newer version of it, which is like it's. Still debatable. Yeah, they have a series now. I see it's a series of it's yeah. debatable. Well, Minakshi, thank you so much for your time. This was a, a, a nice conversation to kind of think about characteristics for science teachers, as and, and that's rooted in the NGSS, which I think is a is a good shift that we're we're seeing and starting to see in in many more classrooms around the U.S. Yes, definitely. And in Georgia, we don't we don't follow the next generation science standards as such. Uh, we are motivated by them. So I really like to talk about the idea of three-dimensional learning. Absolutely. I like kind of switch to that vocabulary of like how we are using these cross-cutting ideas and science and engineering practices in integration with the science content, even if you are using the Georgia science standards, how these things are embedded in these standards. So you need to see that how these three-dimensional idea is still visible in the standards that we have in our state, even if it's not NGSS. 
sure. you can just kind of drop silently the end, just be like, mm, GSS, like <laughs> Georgia Science Standards, right? <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, and uh, we wish you good luck, and, and we'd love to see your, your teachers come, into, come up to Wisconsin as well. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Lab Out Loud. If you'd like to learn more about some of the things discussed in this episode or previous episodes, you can find show notes at our website, laboutloud.com. If you have a guest idea or a future topic that you'd like to see on Lab Out Loud, go to our contact page and send us a message. Also, you can subscribe to Lab Out Loud on your favorite podcasting app, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to find podcasts. While you're there, leave us a review and rating. Your input helps others find our show. Thanks again for listening.